Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Women Who Rock Investigate, where branding just got even better for women. Our media source provides case studies in the areas of health, policy and government, human resources, and more. Our experts are handpicked with credible information to validate the latest in these studies. Join us each Tuesday at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time after Women Who Rock with Success. Now, let's go to the show. And good morning and welcome to Women Who Rock Investigates. Um, Thank you so much for tuning in with us on today. And so today we will be discussing um, information in regards to um, DACA immigrants and um, to the questions that um, that uh, may pose uh, to some of um, the um, individuals who are affected through DACA. And so we are still waiting for our uh, panelists to come on uh, to the show, and uh, we will be back with you in just a moment. Good morning and welcome to the show. Hi, this is JJ to Spain. I'm here. Good morning. Thank you so much <laughs> for um joining us. <laughs> um and yeah. I think some of our some of our panelists may have been a little uh uh, well, you were the only panelist, but I think some of the mm. the guests may have been just a little afraid, so they sent me <laughs> the questions. Oh, <laughs> they sent, yeah, they sent me the questions uh, privately, um, and oh, so okay. we're gonna go. Uh, we're gonna go from there. That's that's still okay sure. because they still can be able to um, retrieve the information from the podcast, and then I will also share yeah. a link as well in the group, and so that still will be helpful to them. So uh, this is yeah. um, a total. Um, um, this is the same audience, but this is um, actually an audience that is included with the show on today. So I would like for you to be able to um, give a little introduction about yourself and a little bit about sure. Wilner and O'Reilly. Yeah, uh, yeah, very good. So my name is JJ Despain, and I am the managing attorney for the firm in Boise, Idaho. We have offices in Idaho and Utah and California. And uh, our firm's been around for quite a while, I think almost 20 years, and we do anything to do with immigration. And we're actually one of the biggest firms in the country that does only immigration. So uh, we've got a team of about 20 or so experts, uh, mm-hmm. and as well as paralegals and a lot of support staff. And so, uh, yeah, we've got a lot of experience pretty much any situation. One of us has faced it. If, if, if there's something I haven't seen before, I've got 19 other attorneys I can check with and chances are one of them can answer my questions or uh, or figure out uh, what to do. So yeah, we've got a lot of experience and uh, I've really enjoyed being a part of the firm and doing immigration law. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's something where uh, it, it really is maybe not a matter of life or death necessarily, but maybe the next mm-hmm. most important thing where we're talking about keeping families together, helping mm-hmm. people have a, a chance to stay in this country and support their families and, and be together. So it's very rewarding. It's tough and stressful, but it's a rewarding job. And so I'm happy to, mm-hmm. you know, share advice, answer people's questions, and uh, help them kind of figure out those goals to be together as a family or to get a job or to live in the United States somehow. 
Mm-hmm. Great, great. What an awesome introduction because um, as I may have mentioned on an earlier um, broadcast um, in regards to um, immigrants, and I hate to use that word um, immigrant, but um, some individuals are fearful. And so when I went to the yeah. group today, um, they were very, very responsive. I think I got about 100 comments. And so, oh, wow. um, but so, yeah, but sometimes individuals like immigrants, they will freeze up at the last minute because they feel that you're going to yeah. use their name and somebody's going to come out searching for them. And so yeah. um, it's, it's not like that uh, at all. So the first question that right. I do have on the group is, what is truly brought blocking? This is from one of the one of the uh, uh, the individuals. It says, "What is truly blocking our path, their path as citizens to citizenship?" Yeah, so um, that's a good question. So a lot of people do think of immigration as just this black or white issue, like either mm-hmm. you're here legally or you're here illegally. But there's a lot more uh, that gets involved. And so, basically, to become a U.S. citizen, it pretty much starts with either uh, being born in the United States or having parents who are U.S. citizens, or if you don't have that, then you have to become a permanent resident first, and then after that, uh, become a U.S. citizen. A permanent resident, there's a lot of different ways to get there, um, and it depends on family relationships. It could depend on work relationships. Sometimes you can become a permanent Mm -hmm. resident through an employer. depends on how you came into the country, how many times you've been in the country, and how much time you've been here. So there's a lot of different factors that go into it. But uh, because of that, I mean, there are a lot of paths to get there. So, you know, if if someone came in without a visa, they might think there's no options, but there probably are. Or if someone thinks, well, um, I've already been in the U.S. for 20 or 30 years, what's the use of starting now? But there probably is something we can do to get... Uh, something more stable, something more uh, confirmed. And so, uh, yeah, there's basically a permanent residency. There's a lot of different ways to get there. Once you get there, then it's usually just a matter of some patience and uh, a little bit of uh, paperwork to become a citizen. So, so the citizenship part it can be easy if you have a green card and if everything is, is fine after that. Mhm. Mhm. Okay. Okay. Second question uh, for you, yeah. um, JJ, is it says does uh, Congress are they the only one that has the power to um, to grant a citizenship with an executive order? Good. Yeah. Good question. So the president does have a lot of power when it comes to immigration to. Uh, have some pretty wide ranging uh, rules and regulations and uh, Mm -hmm. that's something we talked about the last time uh, we were talking where um, and that can go either way either to expand opportunities Mm -hmm. or to restrict them but as far as the actual rules of how to become a permanent resident how to become a US citizen that is mostly up to Congress so that's why uh, like like DACA is a good example where a few years ago, they tried to do something through Congress to make a, a new path to permanent residency, and it fell through. And that's why President Obama back then thought as kind of a backup plan, well, we, we didn't get this done with Congress, but I'll do everything I can as a president to at least give work permits to these people. So it's not the same as permanent residency, but at least gives a little bit of stability there. And so, um, yeah, and then we've seen that happen in the past couple of years, whether it's the travel bans, where the Trump administration has tried to pick certain countries that he said are uh, too dangerous to let people into the U.S. I mean, that was one of the first things he did after he became president. And that's something that uh, that a president is able to do. Or, like right now, a lot of the embassies are closed because of the coronavirus. And that's something else mm-hmm. that is part of the executive branch, part of the, what the president and the secretary of state can do. So yeah, that's that's part of what makes immigration so complicated is some stuff is with the president, some is with Congress, some is with the mm-hmm. courts, and some is at the federal level, some is at the state level. You know, there's there's a lot of different government agencies involved that we have to work with. Okay, and so uh, we, we're going to put that, that question on hold for us for the next question, which is huge, mm-hmm. but I'm going to put that on a pin in that for a second. And so I would like mm-hmm. to ask also as to when immigrants are... Um, in the process of being um, in the intake sentencing. And I think this is, has been on the news 
back here last year, 2019, of the outcry of how they are, um, I guess, um, all into one big cage because I've worked for a federal mm-hmm. institution 12 years ago. And so that's how they would do it at our facility, too. If 50 of them come in mm-hmm. and they get arrested, all of them be packed into the same um, actual area. And you would think that that would be some sort of violation, especially because of the BOP prisoners are not treated like that. Neither are the, uh, mm-hmm. uh, the Department of Justice. So what rights do, even though they're illegal, even though they're illegal here mm-hmm. in the United States and they're in the process of being intake, being deported, what rights do they have while they are here? Yeah, so a lot of these people who are uh, stuck at the border and, and are being detained there, a lot of them are here to look for asylum. And, and basically what okay. asylum means is that they are fleeing their home countries because they are in a dangerous situation and, and mm-hmm. they're scared to be in their own countries. And everybody has a right to ask for asylum when they get here. And it can be complicated. They might not have a high chance of success of actually getting asylum, but uh, they, they have the right to try. And that's what uh, we, we help. We have a lot of asylum cases that those are getting tougher mm-hmm. and tougher as time goes on. But um, you know, since I'm up here in Idaho, I don't deal a whole lot with people at, who are actually at the border. Occasionally there will be like a family member who says my brother is detained at the border or, or something like that. But mostly I'm dealing with people who already got here somehow. You know, they managed to okay. cross the border, managed to get in. But then okay. for asylum, we can look at whether, uh, you know, what the strategies are. You know, but with asylum, a lot of it is based on... Um, the person as far as like their social group or what ethnicity there might be or what religion or even gender Mm -hmm. and how Mm -hmm. they're persecuted because of that so you know we have cases from people who are on the wrong side of the political spectrum in a country like colombia or venezuela where you know they they protested against the president there or against the power in party and feared for their lives because of it so Mm -hmm. now they're here in the u.s or uh things like that so so we try to look okay. and see what is the reason why they fear going back to their country and then talk about whether asylum is a good idea, uh, whether mm-hmm. it's worth the hassle. It can be years waiting for an asylum decision or, um, uh, and, and sometimes it's hard to get evidence, especially if someone left their country in a hurry. They probably got mm-hmm. here without bringing a whole lot of documents with them. Um, okay. But yeah, that's part of our job is to look and see what the strengths and weaknesses are. But, uh, yeah, that, that's probably the number one thing people are looking for when they're mm-hmm. stuck at the border. They don't have a visa. They don't have any other way to get in, but they say they want to try to get asylum. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, great, because I know that uh, fear plays a big factor on um, some Hispanics when they enter the country, whether legal or mm-hmm. illegal. And so that's the reason why I, I reached out to them and also to mm-hmm. you and your firm to see if you could be able to help to unease some of the fear that they perhaps mm-hmm. may live in because like I stated once I shared the information as you being on the podcast it was like it, they was charged it was, a, it was a lot of people that were responding because people are looking for information and they have that right yeah. and it just seems like at the last minute they kind of got cold feet and so I'm still going to share mm-hmm. it with um, you know with them to make sure that they can get whatever it is that they need so next question yeah. and it is yeah. in regards to uh, one of the the um, individual states, she says, I'm a single mom of two-year-old, and I'm um, I'm only working, and this is something that they are, uh, are also have concerns about uh, employment. And it says, so one day, oh, she's only working one day a week because she don't have anyone to take care of her daughter. So she worked for a restaurant. And so uh, mm-hmm. to wrap it up, it says it affects my DACA if it will not, it says, She's wondering if that will affect her DACA for only working one day out of a week, but only ten, eight to ten hours. I'm trying to understand her. Mm. It says, in, but it said, will it it affect her DACA because she's not working as a full time employment? That's what I'm. I think that's what she's saying. I see. Okay. Yeah. Well, if she already has DACA, then uh, that shouldn't be a problem. So, so what DACA gets somebody is a work permit, but that doesn't mean they are required to work or required to 
uh, work a certain number of hours or be full time or anything like that. Sometimes, you know, we, we do DACA cases for kids who are maybe even still in high school and or still mm. too young to really be working full time. But they okay. have a work permit. That means they can get a Social Security number and that means they can maybe uh, take, uh, take advantage of some other benefits, maybe get a driver license, depending on the state they live in. Um, so, yeah, if she is not working full time, that, that won't jeopardize her immigration status if she has DACA. Um, one, one thing to keep in mind is with DACA, it's possible that there are certain programs that the person would not qualify for, things like Medicaid oh, or okay. food stamps or WIC or things like that. Um, mm -hmm that DACA is not, uh, it's technically not an immigration status. We, we usually call it that way, but it basically just means you have a work permit, but you still don't have status. And so because mm -hmm. of that, there's a lot of things you aren't able to get. But with a work permit, you get a social security number, which opens up a lot of doors. And so uh, if she already has that, that's good. And if she's working uh, less than full time, you know, that's that's fine. She doesn't have to worry about immigration. Sounds like she has plenty of other things to worry about, but luckily immigration is not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Great response. Great response. And so the <laughs> next question is in regards to international students. And so this mm. was a, another concern to see if they were uh, going to be deported, um, even in regards because it's still, uh, I think it was uh, something that the president uh, had agreed to sign, if I'm not mistaken, that that's on here too that he agreed to sign, but some of the immigrants still worry about that. Well, the, you know, you're just saying that yeah. and then you turn around when it's time for your election, you're going to take it off the table and you're not going to sign it. You're still going to try to deport us back over here. So one of them was mm. concerned about international students being here in the United States and mm -hmm. is, is they're saying whether they um, have a fear of being deported or not, you know, due to the COVID-19, everybody have to be yeah. online, most of it. And so that's their concern. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good question. That's been one of the other big news stories recently with immigration and, and really quick. So I'll, I'll kind of give a little okay. bit of background for people who maybe um, aren't sure what we're talking about. So okay. if someone is here with a student visa, there's a lot of different restrictions on uh, how to be, actually be a student and keep that visa. So one of them is mm -hmm. you can't just come here to take classes online. You have to actually be enrolled at a school and attend classes. Well, uh, when COVID-19 became a big problem and, and a lot of schools moved to online, uh, they suspended that rule. And so that the meaning ICE is the one that handles that rule and, and checks up on students and their status. And so ICE said, you know, because of COVID-19, if you're taking your classes online, that's okay. I will sort of uh, waive that rule for the time being. Well, what they announced a few days ago was basically that they were going to go back to the normal rule and say, starting in the fall, you have to be in class. You have to take classes in person. If you're all online, then you, you're no longer mm -hmm. a student, uh, according okay. to the student visa. But a few days later, they changed their minds again, basically. So what happened was a, a few universities like Harvard and MIT, they sued the White House, they sued the, the government. Uh, a lot of other schools uh, came out against it too. And so basically the president backed down and said, okay, never mind. We'll just keep it the way it has been during the spring and summer uh, because of COVID-19. If you're taking classes mm -hmm. online, you can still be a student for the student visa. So uh, yeah, it was interesting to see that because we were trying to scramble and think of some options or help people know, uh, well, maybe you're going to be fine because you at least have a few classes um, where you're in person or, you know, the schools are trying to figure out things. But then it turned out to not actually be that big of a problem for now. So any international students who are here uh, are safe from that. Um, you know, it could change in the future, but for now there isn't any danger of anyone if they're taking classes online in the fall, they're still protected. They can still be considered students for purpose of their visas. Okay, okay, great, great, okay. And so um, the next question is is in regards to EAD card. I think that's what this says. Uh -huh. So the question is how long after, after getting approved should – um, I expect to get my EAD card. Now, that's the first part of the mm. question. The second part of the okay. question is, 
I would like to for you to share with them as how to protect themselves from scams. So take, for instance, even mm. if the president does not sign and they can be able to, you know, be able to live freely in the United States, of course, you're going to, you always have scammers to everything that goes on yeah. in the United States just about. And so how can they protect themselves from it? And the, the first question was, how long after uh, getting approved do they uh, expect to receive the EAD card? Yeah, yeah, good question. So uh, when we say EAD card, EAD stands for Employment Authorization Document. And so basically that's a work permit. So when we say work permit, okay. EAD, they're all the same thing. And there are lots okay. of different ways to get a work permit. Um, they're, all of them are connected to some other type of visa or green card process. So there's no such thing as just a work permit all by itself. So they're all connected okay. to some other process. And because of that, it kind of depends on what that process is uh, for how long it would take to actually get an EAD. If someone has an EAD approval, usually the way that works is you get a letter in the mail that says you're approved, and then the card should be coming maybe just a couple days later. Um, but uh, if you aren't approved yet, it depends on, on a lot of different things, how long you have to wait for that. Um, it could be anywhere between three months to a year, depending on what the process is. Uh, oh. But yeah, if you if you already know you're approved, then then you're just waiting on the actual card in the mail. That should come right away. If not, mm -hmm. that then there's a way to report that to, um, that, that would usually be USCIS. That's the part of the government that would handle that part. And there's some ways to follow up and say, my card didn't come in the mail or Maybe maybe there's an address that's wrong or something happened with the actual postal service or, you know, there's lots of different possibilities <laughs> there. Um, yeah, and then um, for the second part of that question, uh, yeah, there are different scams out there, and I've seen a lot where, unfortunately, there are people out there who are taking advantage of these immigrants. They either take advantage of the fact that they might not know English very well or they are new to the country and aren't really aware of different cultural and language things. And so, yeah, you definitely have to be careful. I think the number one uh, piece of advice I would have for that is to just do some research on, uh, on the different options for immigration attorneys or other resources. Talk to friends, talk to other people you know who have gone through similar uh, immigration processes and, and just see who they recommend. A lot of mm -hmm. our clients come in because we did work for a family member or a friend and they recommended us, and so we end up helping all their friends and family and, and just by word of mouth. We also mm -hmm. um, get a lot of people who come in because they find us on Google. They just Google immigration attorneys, Boise, or even uh, you know just lawyers in Boise or something like that. And mm -hmm. uh, fortunately for us, we have some good reviews on Google. We, we're rated pretty okay. high on Google. So we, uh, you know, people look at that and say, oh, they must do a pretty good job. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, you definitely want to do some research and uh, not just take somebody at their word, but look and see the work they've done for other people. And uh, mm -hmm. like one, one example I'll, I'll, I'll describe quickly is um, in Mexico, uh, and it, there's a notario in Spanish that notario could mean someone who uh, is an attorney and can do legal work, but in the United States the the translation is a notary, and a notary in the United States is not the same thing as a lawyer, but in Mexico okay. it is, and so there's oh. some confusion there where someone will take advantage of that basically and say I'm a notary, I'm a notario, I can help you with your immigration process, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're a lawyer, but they kind of mislead their clients to think that they are a lawyer and it can mess things up where they get get people in more trouble than when they started and and sometimes you need an actual lawyer to clean up the mess and that's some of what yeah. we do uh, okay. but yeah that, but that's an example of something i've seen where unfortunately uh, people take advantage of these immigrants they don't have their best interests at heart uh, but i can promise that uh, there are people out there, not just me. I mean, I certainly uh, do the best I can and, and always mm -hmm. try to be honest and, and uh, with my clients. But of course, there are other attorneys as well and other people out there who are doing a good job. So I don't mean to mm -hmm. say all, all attorneys are doing a bad job, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's something you have to be careful of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, the next question is in regards to um, 
This is coming from two different states. One lives in um, Utah and one lives in Chicago. And so the question okay. is, uh, it says, uh, so uh, they have a friend, and this is in regards to employment because of the DACA Dreamers. Some, the ones that are in Chicago, it's, it seems, seems like they are able to work and pursue a field in law enforcement as a police officer. However, mm-hmm. the ones that are in Utah will not be able to be considered as um, employment, even if they mm-hmm. are legal I- immigrants. And so um, if you could, you know, uh, um, if you could or have any expertise on that for them, um, if you would address that for the audience. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if, if you have DOC or, if, or, or have um, a work permit, uh, that does mean you're allowed to work, but there might be extra requirements based on what the actual job is. And so what it sounds like to me is that uh, some law enforcement agencies maybe have extra requirements, like maybe they say you do have to be a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident. And it's not that you're considered to be illegally working or that you're not allowed to be in the U.S. It just means you're not allowed to uh, apply for that job or, or that you aren't qualified for that particular job. But, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and that's something that just depends on the different agencies, and some states might have more requirements than others. I know uh, a lot of federal jobs, if you want to work for the federal government, you do have to be an actual U.S. citizen, not just that Mm -hmm. you're allowed to be in the United States, but you have to have gone through enough of the process to become a citizen. So, yeah, it might not be necessarily that there's any... Um, anything wrong as far as like breaking some kind of rule or or being disqualified because of immigration Mm -hmm. it might just be that uh, you know that someone in Chicago there they have different rules and so they're able to get a job Mm -hmm. where someone in Utah is not able to Um, but yeah that might just mean uh, looking for other options something like um, you know maybe you can still work in law enforcement but instead of being an officer you're a dispatcher or something like that Mm -hmm. where Mm -hmm. maybe they have less uh, stringent requirements Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so it's not uh, basically yeah. like a, um, a discrimination uh, type of, of 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 term as to right. you know perhaps their their who they are and because of their DACA and what have you. Because I do agree with you on the fact of some. Um, 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 agencies have different uh, policies, terms, and conditions. I know for the federal, uh, while working for them uh, with the U.S. Marshal Service, they will mm-hmm. send individuals to your community and will investigate your background. So some people have different stipulations, <laughs> you know, as you stated. Right. So thank you so much for clearing uh, that up because sometimes um, individuals, if they don't have legal uh, representation or they don't have legal counsel, sometimes we're led to you know, believe whatever someone else tells us or we're led to believe uh, with something that we mm-hmm. read and sometimes articles are not all, have all, you know, credibility to them. So thank you yeah. so much for doing that. Yeah, a lot of those types of jobs too, especially with law enforcement, you know, they, they have issues of maybe national security or things mm-hmm. like that where it's not really about immigration, but it's other reasons why mm-hmm. they only want U.S. citizens or they only want certain people for those jobs. So, yeah, I would say if someone has a work permit and they didn't get a job, um, that doesn't mean that their immigration status is in trouble or that they did something wrong. It just means mm-hmm. maybe they uh, need to look for other options. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's the reason why, I guess, the main reason why I sympathize with them so is because of the mm-hmm. fear, of, you know, of them um, asking questions. They don't know who to ask. They don't know if they're going to be arrested for asking them. They don't know mm-hmm. if they're going to be targeted and what have you and things. And so I kind of uh, feel a little sympathetic for them um, in that area sure. as to why they feel they have to be secluded to each other and things because there are some good people. I've learned a lot from uh, immigrants. And so um, mm-hmm. I just I just have a issue with how sometimes we as citizens of the United States can treat um, others indifferently. So that's just my right. uh, theory on that. So the next question, um, this is in regards to um, uh, paperwork. And so what she says, Carla Mm. says, says she submitted her paperwork to become a resident through her husband, though, which is Mm -hmm. a U.S. citizen. And she said her Mm -hmm. DACA, though, expired on June the 16th of this year. And she wants to know, do she go back and resubmit a renewal? Hmm. Yeah, so without knowing a lot of details about the case, I could say okay. that uh, it probably would be a good idea to renew the DACA, and the reason for that would be 
to get a work permit in case you have to wait for that green card. So, you know, okay. if you're closer to the end of the process where you're almost ready to get a green card, then you probably don't have to worry about renewing that DACA work permit because once you have a green card, that counts as a work permit and a lot of other things. So you don't need a work permit again. But if mm -hmm. you don't know how much longer it's going to take for the green card and you're just waiting, you're allowed to be in the United States. That isn't an issue, but you might not be allowed to work if your work permit expired. And so uh, if, you know, basically it just goes down to if you want something as kind of a backup while you're waiting for the rest of the process, then yeah, it would be a good idea to renew DACA. And even if your DACA has expired, you can still ask for a renewal. And they might have some questions about why you waited for the expiration or, or what took so long to send in the renewal, but mm -hmm. uh, you're still allowed to. So yeah, that okay. would be my advice. Um, I mean, there might be some other factors in that particular case, but based on, on just general cases like that, yeah, a renewing doc is a good idea if you don't want to wait too much longer for the green card. Okay, okay, great. And so the next question is um, in just a little bit off maybe some of the questions that you had answered before. So okay. this, we, we know we have seen in the news um, people are mm -hmm. in an outrage, especially immigrants, about the murdering of the um, of Vanessa, Vanessa Gillian. And so... Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of concerns. Of course, the first thing you know, sometimes we do, we we, we we cry out in action as to, you know, it may be a little racism against that, you know, uh, from the immigration mm -hmm. side. So what type of support, um, I guess, um, in a, I don't know, in, in a empathetic, em empathetic way, could you offer to um, – um, 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 DACA, the DACA dreamers, to the those that are are, are concerned as to whether, because um, that's what I'm I'm seeing that they're trying to see if this um, young lady is going to get justice, even by her being in the military forces and what has happened to her. And some, like I stated, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. individuals may feel that they are discriminated against already because they're legal or unlegal. So, what type of support, mm -hmm. uh, if you if you didn't mind to offer to those that are have a, that concern uh, in regards to Vanessa, because it has touched a yeah. lot of people, even Americans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so there are uh, some good resources for immigrants who are in a similar situation like hers. So uh, one example is there is a type of status available for. Uh, immigrants who are victims of crimes or maybe someone in their family has been the victim of a crime. And mm -hmm. uh, the reason for that is kind of like what you're saying, where uh, immigrants, they are here, they're living kind of in the shadows or trying not to be discovered. Um, but mm -hmm. if they are the victim of a crime, they might get nervous about, well, do I even want to go to the police or am I just going to get myself in trouble? There, mm -hmm. There is a status available for victims of crimes who do report to police, cooperate in their investigation, and it is kind of a way to say that we value their assistance to law enforcement and, and we aren't going to worry as much about whether they're here legally or not or if they overstayed a visa or, or anything like that. And it's kind mm -hmm. of like a waiver or an amnesty for people who are in those situations. So yeah, I, my message to anybody out there, if you've been the victim of a violent crime, don't be afraid to report it to police because mm -hmm. it could help you uh, immigration-wise as well as whatever the crime is, where hopefully the person who hurt you is brought to justice. Uh, and, and that it's kind of a separation between what the actual crime is and the immigration mm -hmm. uh, case. So some people just kind of get it all mixed together and they feel like, well, if I'm here illegally and I go to the police, I'm going to get in trouble. The, the regular local police doesn't actually handle uh, immigration matters very often. Usually they, mm -hmm. uh, there's some overlap sometimes, but a regular city police officer is not supposed to be checking on people's immigration status unless they're arrested or in jail or something like that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if someone comes to them who's the victim, uh, more often than not, the police department is going to appreciate that a crime is being reported, that they're looking for help. And because of that cooperation with law enforcement, then they can get status. Um, it's, we call it a U visa. And it's uh, just because 
basically there's a type of visa for every letter of the alphabet. <laughs> so the U <laughs> visa is the one for crime victims. And uh, yeah, it could be a way to get a work permit, get status, eventually become a permanent resident, and then after that a U.S. citizen. And so, yeah, that's, that's uh, one thing I hope people take away is to not be afraid of the police. Uh, I mean, I know that's something else that's been in the news about whether police are actually hurting or helping our society. But in general, you know, they are here to get crime off the streets. And if you're the victim of a crime like that, um, it, don't be afraid to report it and get some help. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing I'll briefly mention that is kind of related to the story with Vanessa Guillen is um, there are also benefits through military service. So we have families where maybe the parents are here without immigration status, and but they have uh, children who are born here. They're U.S. citizens. They grow up. They join the military. They can help their parents get some kind of immigration status too, because that's another thing that uh, the immigration authorities value is someone who's loyal to their country and dedicated and serving their country and they want to help them out too. So uh, one thing we do is let's say someone they're 20 or 21, they're joining the military, they're in training, well they can help their parents get something called advanced parole which is it's kind of like saying that they are allowed to be in the United States to wait it, it, it's kind of like imagining that they're waiting in line outside of the country to come in. So e mm -hmm. even though, of course, they're already here, it's like treating them like they're waiting in line to come in. So now they have permission to do that. And then eventually that could turn into actually being allowed in. And by that, I mean actually getting a green card, becoming a permanent resident. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, those are some options. So if, if anyone listening is thinking, um, well, I've been the victim of a crime or me or someone in my family is in the military, that can open up some doors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great, great, great response. So for the last question, because we want to save some of them for the next uh, podcast coming up on sure. um, next week, and of course we don't want to drain you <laughs> from all of the, uh, <laughs> the resources that are inside of you, but so this this last question um, today, JJ, is in regards yeah. to real estate. So what Adriana is asking, she says, mm. uh, says she's a you know DACA dreamer. She's from California, um, and she's okay. asking, how do she qualify to be able to buy, purchase a home? See, so again, we mm. are still having these questions from the from immigrants who feel that they may be discriminated because of whether they are legal or non-legal. But perhaps she's DACA, so she is a. Um, mm -hmm. is legal within the United States so she wants to know how does she go by qualifying as a DACA recipient as to trying to purchase her home for her and her husband yeah yeah well that's that's great and I do know a lot of clients who um, you know they're they're able to reach toward that American dream and, and buy a house settle in raise their family here and uh, someone who has DACA is able to do that so uh, I can't speak to the details of mm -hmm. the actual home buying okay. process, but as far okay. as the immigration side of things, uh, someone who has DACA has a work permit and, and can get a social security number. And that makes it easier to get loans or get a mortgage or, um, or get a credit report and all those things that might be necessary for buying a house. So, uh, yeah, it, there shouldn't be any issues because of immigration status because um, – there's definitely not supposed to be any sort of discrimination based on that. No one can deny a loan or deny uh, a house or other uh, purchases or things like that because of immigration status. They could deny based on low credit or maybe someone doesn't have a social security number so they can't check on their credit. But yeah, if someone has a social security number because of a work permit through DACA, then then it, the immigration part of it isn't really involved and everything else um, it is uh, should goes pretty smoothly. Um, yeah, if she wants to buy a house, she shouldn't worry about getting in trouble for trying to buy a house. Uh, you know, most uh, banks or other uh, institutions involved with that are going to be happy to help her out. Mhm, mm mhm. Great, great. JJ, we have had such a awesome uh, opportunity with you today and sharing with the audience and then of course this yeah. will be shared uh, as well with the uh, recipients of DACA and those who perhaps uh, are, are in a little fear 
as to <laughs> what the next yeah. step that they're supposed to take and things. And so they don't have the answers. They are going off of resources according to what each other's experience are or previous experience are. So this is the reason why we have mm-hmm. brought you to the table to be able to give them a little bit more uh, credibility, um, accountability, mm-hmm. and also a little bit more stability in that area. So yeah. this is the opportunity that you could be able to share with the listeners of how they can be able to reach you if they want to follow you um, in the future on any um, of your uh, social media handles or any yeah. uh, books or materials that you have authored. If you can do that at this time. Sure, yeah. Well, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad for this opportunity to try to clear up some misconceptions and provide some clarity, and, and that's something I really want to do. Uh, that's one of the biggest things I want to do with this kind of uh, job is just help people feel more confident, not put in so much guesswork, but actually uh, have some confidence and some optimism, and, and so that's something I always try to do. Uh, to find me, uh, I'm on... Uh, Facebook and Instagram as JJD Immigration. Uh, my name is JJ De Spain, so the initials are JJD Immigration. Uh, on Twitter as well, under JJD Immigration. And then um, my firm, again, is Wilner and O'Reilly. You can find our firm website, that's wilneroreilly.com, and uh, be able to contact us there. And even though I'm here in Idaho, we can do immigration work for anybody uh, anywhere in the world, really. So, uh, yeah, if, if you have more questions or, or maybe have a case you want an attorney to help out with or anything else, uh, try to find me. And I'm happy to answer more questions and, and help people out. Mm-hmm, absolutely. And that was going to be the next statement that I was going to be able to share with the audience and the listeners that uh, this is a Q&A. And if they need to be able to seek uh, further uh information in regards to this they can be able to reach out to you and your law firm um, Mm -hmm. as to how you can be able to take them through the strategic steps that they may need to be able to um, adhere or get some of these um, concerns that they have answered so thank you once again for being Mm -hmm. our guest today and we will see you next Tuesday at the same time at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Standard Time so guests for all the coming events you can go to our website at www dot women who rock with success dot com. So until next week you have a great day.